<clears throat> we're going to look at uh, Genesis 2, verse 4 through the third chapter, verse 5. <clears throat> we're in Toledoth 1. Toledoth 1 is Genesis 2, 4 through the fourth chapter, verse 26. This is the account of the heaven and earth when they were created. And he's going to introduce a new phrase. We have not seen, now we've seen the word day, but we haven't seen the phrase, in the day. Now we've seen the day in, in the first manuscript, of Genesis 1, 1 through the second chapter, verse 3. We've seen the day, day 1 of creation, day 2, day 3, day 4, day 5, day 6, and day 7. But what we have not seen is a phrase that identifies a different understanding of the word day, which is the Hebrew word yom, Y-O-M. And in, in this, you can see in the English, it has the preposition in, I-N, on the front of it. In the Hebrew, that would be B-E, on the front of yom, the yom. And it's going to refer to a period of time. This is introducing to us the period of time of 11 Toledoths. Agreed? We've seen that. And that's a phrase that introduces that. Let me, let me read it again so we don't miss this. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made heaven and earth. He's done something else. We have not seen the word Lord in the first manuscript, we have seen the word Elohim, God, but we have not seen the word Yahweh. That too is a new word. And it is connected with this little phrase, in the day, in this period, God is going to be identified as Yahweh. Yahweh is translated in the English Lord, and it refers to Christ who was introduced to us in chapter 2 in the first manuscript, in chapter 2, verse 3. Because in chapter 2, verse 3, it is not the word it, it is the word him. You remember that? Why? There's no such thing as it in the Hebrew language. So now he opens up Toledoth 1, this new, the, the first of 11. Now, now no shrub of the field was in the earth yet. No plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not set rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. A mist was used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. That's like a canopy environment, a, a greenhouse effect. You know what that is? Th that is, in uh, day two, we had the expanse. Remember the expanse in day two? This is under that canopy. You know, the water above and the water below? That was for Noah's flood. We're not there yet. Um, and so the wa there is no rain water. There's water, but no rain water. The earth operated from a mist, a greenhouse effect during this period. Right? All right. I'm just reading. Then the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, that is the, that is the personal relationship. The word Yahweh refers to the, the member of the Godhead that gets you a personal relationship with God. Yahweh. The Lord gets you a personal relationship with that's John 14, 6 in the New Testament. That's John 14, 6. Right? Huh? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Christ. This is Old Testament here, the same idea. That's with the introduction of the word Yahweh, God is going to have a personal relationship with people. Now, there, it hasn't been formed yet, but it's, 
it's in the works or in the plan. And so the Lord God planted, eight, verse 8, planted a garden towards the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord, call, God, call, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to sight. Watch verse 9. He's going to identify four trees. Every tree that is pleasing to the sight, the tree that is good for food, the tree of life, and also in the midst of garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we, we've got the whole garden situation. Now he introduces river and identity of nations, or we don't have nations yet, but geographical locations are given names. The earth is divided into four, the earth is divided into four uh, land masses identified by names. Uh, at first, he's going to deal. He, he's going to deal with water and land mass. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. Now, these four rivers are going to be important to the four land masses we have given names. One land mass is called Eden, and and that river is the Eden River, and it goes into four other rivers. The first river, Pison, it flows around the whole land of Havilah, there where there is gold. And then he mentions the gold of the land is good, the bellium and the Iox stone are there. The name of the second river, is Gihon, it flows around the whole land of Cush. You see, I've got names of rivers, and these rivers are important uh, to the landmass, and the landmass has names. All right. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. He gives names to them. The first river that flows, flows out of Eden, and waters the garden. Then it turns into four tributary rivers that create four continents. Do you see that? And there are names given to them. Historical names are given to them. Okay, just, this is Toledoth 1, section 1. Then the Lord God took the man... Once he has it set up, he took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It's not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the of the field, every bird of the sky, and brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the sky, the beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at the place. We got first surgery. The Lord God fashioned, look at that name, Lord God. We're talking about Christ. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man, and the man said... This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. What's her first name? Woman. Now she's going to be given another name by Adam in the third chapter, verse 20. Right? And listen, we're, 
Is that is that name is that name still around? It's being challenged today, but is it still not around? Right? Woman. You know where that vocabulary word came from? Adam. In the Garden of Eden section. Well, anyhow. She shall pay, she'll be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother. Did they have fathers? Did Adam and Eve have father and mother? No, this is prophetic, right? This is prophetic. Uh, they shall become one flesh, the man and his wife, and they were both naked and not ashamed. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said to you, you shall not eat the tree of the garden. Had God said indeed? Yeah, he, I mean, he made it pretty emphatic, didn't he? That's, an, that's indeed is an emphatic idea. That's an absolute. Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the tree, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. That's second, that, that's in chapter 2, verse 16 and verse 17. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you, shan't, you sure, surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. I mean, is that right, right out of the heart of Satan? That's his playbook, isn't it? That's part, that was his key to his fall. You will be like God doing good and evil. I'm going to stop there because we, they, they haven't done it yet. Agreed? It's being suggested, <laughs> right? The serpent has made a suggestion, has given a call, an alter idea, an alternative to why you should eat. Okay? All right. Well, let's have, let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to get into this. The Garden of Eden period, we know we're talking about that because he used a special phrase, in the day. That's a period. Uh, you take a moment as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. That allows the Holy Spirit to regain control, to teach and recall John 14, 26, the Word of God. Personal sin should be confessed. That could be mental attitude type, sins of the tongue or overt sins should be confessed in silence or privacy part of study. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us the Word of God, taken out of the book of Genesis, the very names that Adam called everybody were placed in a dictionary, and we still use them. Long before Webster, we had Adam, and he had a dictionary and the words are still prominent. They're still prominent. That's amazing to me. And they will be throughout human history, no matter how man tries to change them, because the word of God always declare what, what is what is. And so I pray that we would never stray from the word of God because it's the only sanity in the world. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a look at this. <clears throat> one of the things that we learn about the Garden of Eden is that it was a paradise. It was created to be a paradise for mankind. A paradise. There has never been anything like it in human history, and there never will be. Not even the millennium will compare with what paradise was. The only way, and paradise is still in existence, and the only way you can get into paradise is through Jesus Christ. You have to be born again. You have to be born again. And we'll talk about this today. The only way back to paradise is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God sent Yahweh, the Lord, back to the world 
to die on a cross for our sins, to be buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Those people who believe that will once again find paradise, and those who don't will never find it. They will find hell, not paradise. Okay? Jesus told one of the thieves, you know, there was a thief on each side of Christ being crucified along with him. Agreed? He said to one of the thieves on the cross, today, crucifixion day, you will be with me in paradise. And he went to Hades. And in Hades was Abraham's bosom or paradise for the believer. We have studied Hades or Sheol. You should be familiar with that. Today, Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. All right? That's very important. In the 16th chapter of Luke, and I just quoted Luke 23, 46. It's on your paper. Or 43. In Luke 16, somewhere around verse 19, there were two men who died. We don't think this is a parable because he gave a name of a person in it. He, he, he's never done that before. He referred to the poor man who died, the beggar, as Lazarus. And in a discussion that went on, Lazarus had five brothers still in existence. In other words, you could have, if, of course, you couldn't. I was going to say you could get a news reporter and he could go search us. We, we don't have any more that do search out news anymore. <clears throat> they don't follow news. They create it. They don't follow it. But if you lived in that day when Jesus told this, you could have looked up to see where is this Lazarus that is well-known beggar who died at the same time one of the very rich people died. It would be found in Luke 16. In verse 19, the poor man died, and he went to Abraham's bosom, paradise. The rich man died, and in torment, we call that hell, in torment of Sheol, right? In torment of Sheol. And they're compared with their lives both now and later. They're compared to what their life was when they both lived on the earth and had their daily encounters, you know, where they went. You know, one went to Chick-fil-A and the other hoped that he would bring back something from there to give him. Right? You probably didn't know that about a Chick-fil-A, but there it is. <clears throat> One dies. They both die. Funerals the same day. <clears throat> they go different places. They die and go to different places. They both go to Hades. One goes to paradise and one, one goes to torment. One's a believer and one isn't. And so it is. And so you ought to read that. Um, Because here was a beggar, he had a, he had a miserable life on earth. Here was a rich man who had just a very comfortable, wonderful life. But when they died, they were reversed, because one was a believer and one wasn't. You may get out of life this way, but you won't get out of death that way. That's the story, right? You may have a great life here. But without Christ, the next life will be the most miserable life you could have ever imagined in the whole wide world. And he goes into great detail. Jesus went into great detail about the conditions of being in torment. You should read that. Not now. <laughs> but you should read that. If you think, well, I'll take my chances. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Here's a gun with a bullet in it. Let's, let's, let's play the game. Man, that's just roulette. 
we used to call it Russian roulette. That's kind of an interesting name for it, isn't it? Russian roulette. Well, anyhow, they're still playing that game, aren't they? In 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, we're told by Paul that when he died, he was caught up to paradise. Wait a minute. I thought paradise was down below the earth. It was. Well, how did it get up there then? When Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, paradise was removed from Hades to there so that when a church age believer dies, he goes up to paradise. That's what Paul said. I haven't been there yet, but he had been. I'm still <clears throat> trying to get through my daily struggle here. <clears throat> John records, John the writer of the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, you know, and Revelation, that writer, John, records that the Holy Spirit spoke to the church of Ephesus with this message. Talking about the person who would be born again, I will give the right to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He says that to the church of Ephesus. That's recorded in the Revelation 2.7 to the church of Ephesus. The writer John is going to go on and discuss this paradise of God in heaven in, in Revelation 22. You should read that. that that's, that's going to be your life in Christ. Let me tell you. You ever known of a, have you known of a teenager who died recently? Have you heard about it on the radio? Have you heard about it on TV? What are the odds that you sitting here today, maybe as a young person, a young teenager, a young adult, you got your whole life to live for and you're just excited about it and you should be? What are the odds? That you could die. What are the odds? They're pretty high right now. And if somebody offers you some little colored pills that look like candy, I'd stay away from them. You need to be prepared not only for life, but you need to be prepared for death. When we're losing over 100,000 kids to drugs, and that number again by suicide, we're in trouble as a nation. And we need to get kids saved. Think how tragic it was for that family with that young lady who was sitting at a railroad track and couldn't get across it, and her car got shot up for, for apparently no reason. And she is dead. A senior is dead. A senior of college, all the way through school, ready, ready to graduate. We need to be vigilant as a church. Within your family structure, you need to get people saved. You need to get them back into fellowship. You need to get them with the Lord. We're in troubling times, dear hearts. We're in troubling times. And the church is the answer. There's no, it's not, the, listen, politics is not the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. Straight up and straight out. The Garden of Eden period, quoted in the day, the Garden of Eden period is introduced in Genesis 2-4 in the phrase, in the day. It introduces a new concept of days in the second manuscript, different than the first manuscript where he talks about the days of creation. We're now talking about periods of human history. I want to look at four ideas today about the Garden of 
period, the Garden of Eden period, which most theologians call the period of innocence. The period of innocence. And I'll tell you why as we walk our way through it. What I did for you is I took Toledoth 1, Genesis 2, 4, through the fourth chapter 26, and I broke it into three, three sections because these are the events and how they moved along. In section 1, Genesis 2, 4, 3 through 5, which I read to you, this is the period of innocence in the Garden of Eden. This is the period where they go right up to the tree but don't eat from it. This is the period the theologians, men like Unger and Schofield and, and a slew of others, refer to the time between the creation of Adam and Eve and their sin. They refer to that period as the period of innocence. It is the period of not breaking or transgressing the law of 2 Corinthians, I mean of uh, Genesis 2.17. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day you eat, die, and you will die. That's called the Enoch law, the law of Eden. Just one law. you think everybody could keep one law, couldn't they? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. This is the period of innocence. It is the only recorded such period in human history. You're going to read the rest of the Bible and never find this again. I, I'm just hoping you will let me in uh, to teach you today. That's all I'm doing there. The period of innocent is the only recorded period in human history, not even the millennium. In Genesis, the third chapter, verses 6 through 24, we have a second issue. This is the period of Adamic sin. This is the period of Adamic sin. This is when they ate of the tree and the consequences of it. Genesis 3, 6 through 24. This is the period of Adamic sin, a violation of the Enoch law, and the judgment that came, and the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. That's that period. This, this is picked up by Paul in the, New, in the New Testament, like in Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, that one man was Adam. If you go on and read it through 21. And so death, sin and death passed upon all mankind. 1 Corinthians 15.22, in Adam all die, and Christ all are made alive. These are the issues. I mean, we operate in the church as that's absolute fact, right? We, we believe this is absolute. <clears throat> write, this, write, to, write these verses down under this, under this section. Write down 2 Corinthians 2.11. You need to become very familiar with this because we're being bombarded by it. And we don't know how, listen, we're up to our eyeballs in the angelic conflict and don't know how to fight to win. <laughs> Is that not sad? The church don't know how to beat Satan at his game. You know why? Well, in 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul tells you why the church can't fight and win. Because they don't understand the, the, the strategy that the, that the devil uses against the church of believers. You should read that, man, because you're in the midst of this. You should be familiar with that. You ought to be, as, as a wise person, you ought to be in Bible study. In this church, whenever you get an opportunity to set your feet in this Bible study, you should be sitting in it. Now, I know not everybody can get for lunch on Tuesday, but if you've got an opening on Tuesday for lunch from 12 to 1, you ought to be here. Because you've got to arm yourself. You've got to put on the full armor of God and understand the strategy that the devil used to fight us, to beat us. You've got to be able to do that. 
You need to be familiar with 2 Corinthians 2.11. You need to be very familiar with that. It, and you know what the key word in there is? Ignorant. Ignorant. Do not be ignorant of the strategy the devil uses against the church to get them out of the Word of God. Was he successful with Eve to get her away from the Word of God? He got her absolutely turned around to do the opposite of what God told her not to do, right? Have we not parented kids? You go like, uh, how many times have I told you don't do that? And they go ahead and do it, right? Why? Well, uh, probably my kids. It's probably just my kids. That's probably just mine. Here's the third section, Genesis 4, 1 through 26. That's the third section of Taladoth 1. This is the period of pain, parental pain. Write that down. This pain is parental. Oh, listen, some of us have, have gone through this. And if not with your kids, but your grandkids or your great-grandkids, if you live that long. Parental pain. When you read Genesis 4, that chapter, you will get a good picture of parental pain. Parental pain associated with the fallen nature of the, of the first family of the human race in the angelic conflict. Listen, the devil's on a roll, <laughs> right? He got Adam and Eve. Now he's after her kids. Oh, yeah, you're not listening to me. He got the parents, and now what's he want? Is he happy just to have the parents all, all screwy? He's going to get your kids. You know why he's confident? Because he got you. You know why he's confident? Because he's been able to disrupt your life so many times and you, and you, and you feel the pain he inflicts upon it. He'll inf As a single person, he'll do it. As a married person, he'll do it. He'll inflict pain on you like you can't imagine. And then he'll turn on your kids. And he'll put such pain on your kids, your grandkids, and your great-grandkids. I don't know if I'll get to great-great. But I'll tell you one thing. Grandpa's going to fight for him. Great-grandfather is going to fight for him. I'm, I'm going to fight for my kids. Because I know the devil wants them. And I know he can get them if they're not guarded. They need to be guarded. We live in a day when we need to guard them. Now, I don't mean take, take freedoms away from them. That's not guarding them. Be their protector with the Word of God. Arm your children with the Word of God. Put on the full armor of God. You think little kids can't do that? Listen, little kids can do it. I've got little kids in my family that are grandkids that can do this. And if their parents won't teach my, my grand, great-grandchildren, I'll teach them. They'll let me in the house. I, I'm grandpa. If not, if if. If, if not us, then who? Would you agree with that? If not us, then who? Bring your kids to church and let us have a chance with them. We'll arm them with the spiritual warfare to beat the devil. Send them to camp every year. We'll help you. We'll help you. When you read Genesis 4, you're going to see parental pain from the fallen nature of Adam's sin. Listen to this. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, who murdered his brother. And for what reason? See, we always want a reason for people killing people. 
You ought to listen to this. And for what reason did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. See, there's your warfare. The bottom line of warfare is evil against good, right? Righteousness against unrighteousness. He's after your kids. Are you paying any attention in America? He's after kids. He's after kids. He's after grandkids and great grand. He's after them. And boy, if you spend any time with the youth of America today, I don't care if you live in Hoover or Moody. You're going to see a mess. And you know what? When you look around them and see who is managing them, you're going to find their parents are a bigger mess than the kids are. Oh, my, 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 my. We should be appalled what we've allowed the teaching people, the curriculums, not the teachers, but the curriculum that the teachers are forced to teach today or leave their income or leave their security that they worked all hard for for retirement. What a mess we're in. And so here's what parents have done. Listen, and rightly so, they stepped up and are homeschooling their children because they don't dare send them. There is so much violence and so much screw, screwy stuff going on in the school systems, they don't, it's better off to have them at home and safeguard them. I get, I get word from parents all over the United States on this. They think somehow, because I teach so much, that I probably have a system of schooling. Listen, there are some great homeschooling systems out there today. What you need to do is get involved with them and use a Christian influence on them. That's what my daughter Angela and Dave do. They pull their kids out of this system, put them in a good home system, and they're part of a network, and they're trying to have influence upon that network and that network upon the other network for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Well, anyhow, stop and think a minute about Adam and Eve with me. Adam and Eve, think how far they have fallen and how much they have lost in a short period of time. Right? I mean, they were in paradise. They had, didn't have a cure in the world. There was no sin nature. There was no Adam's sin. There was none of that. There was the devil, however. But he didn't have any influence over their life. And he couldn't change them or anything. He couldn't mess with the garden. He couldn't mess with them other than influence, right? And they had volition. They could have said, no, get out of here. Go back and play with a snake you like. How far have this couple fallen and how much have they lost by the end of chapter 4? I mean, they fell in chapter 3. Think how much they lost and how much pain has been inflicted upon them in a short period of time by Satan. My, 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 people. Oh, my goodness. When you read this whole thing, was Satan allowed to play in the garden? Was he allowed to play in the garden? Oh, yeah. I mean, he can't go where God don't want him to go. He could put a hedge around it, right? He could, put a, he could have put a spiritual wall around an electric fence that would have scared the devil to death. He didn't. Because of the angelic conflict, he didn't because of the importance of human volition to make choices for God. And so it is in America today. And so it is in America today. So what did, write this down. Write, write this down. 2 Corinthians eleven, fourteen. 14. I, I'm sure I didn't put it because I wrote, big, I wrote this in big letters on my, pa my paper. You know what this says? The devil never shows up like you think he is. He's going to be in a red suit and 
you know, he's got a day, he's got a pitchfork and he knocks on the door and says, I'm the devil. It's, he, he, it's not Halloween for him. He's going to show up like Santa Claus in Christmas. He's going to be in disguise, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. He's going to masquerade in a costume. You know, you know the story, little little Red Riding Hood, right? Well, maybe you don't. Listen, when you read 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, it says that Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light. <laughs> but who is he really? He is the death of darkness. Point number two. We will examine four features of the period of innocence. That would be 2, 4 through 3, 5. In the paradise called the Garden of Eden. I want to show you a few things that they had that they lost. Mankind's first home was paradise as a testimony to God's grace. Did, did, they, did they create this paradise? <laughs> no, they just got to call it that. One day they're sitting around it. God says to Adam, what do you, let's figure a name that we could call this. He said, well, it, it, you call it the Garden of Eden. No, let's have a name that really describes how it makes us feel. He comes up with paradise. That must have been an interesting conversation between him and Yahweh, huh? Well, if you and I talk about paradise, we would talk about it from a whole different range because we have a fallen nature. We have a sin nature with the Adam's sin that has to be eradicated and all that kind of stuff. They didn't have any of that. He calls them paradise. That must have been an interesting conversation. Paradise. Paradise. And what is paradise? It's the epitome of God's amazing grace. It's the epitome of God's amazing grace. Oh, my goodness. You know, it wasn't a primitive cave that made man's life miserable. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I used to get a newspaper once a week out on the farm. And I immediately turned to the cartoon section, right? And there was alley -oop. Great big arms, had a club, caveman idea. And I always thought that's probably how man started. If you listen to the professors, they would tell you that's how man started. In a cave with nothing, and, man, 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 look at he's lift, lifted himself up by the boot, strap boots, uh, and away he goes. Truth of the matter, nothing like that. It, at his best day in a fallen state, he'll never have paradise. Man, his best day, he'll never have paradise. Well, God's grace gave mankind three, three of the five divine institutions during this period of innocence, gave him freedom, and this is important, it gave him freedom, employment, and marriage in the period of innocence. See, that's Genesis 2, 4 through 25. Later, in chapter 10 and 11, he'll give him uh, a nation in chapter four, he'll give them a family. He gave them, he gave them four continents. Eden, and well, I got them, I got them all listed there for you. And we already talked about. It. Gave them four rivers. They had water, but no rain. They had a what? Mist that kept everything greenhouse effect until the flood came. All of this is God's amazing grace. God's amazing grace. God's amazing grace. And listen, a lot of these names are still prevalent, aren't they? A lot of these names are still prevalent. Other, other some of the names have been changed, but the idea is still there. It's just kind of interesting. 
historically. Four types of trees were given in the period were, were given during a period of innocence, and they were designed to sustain perfect state of life during the period of, for food, for knowledge, for pleasure, and for life. Isn't that interesting? What do you I mean, how would you describe your life in paradise? <laughs> huh? Isn't that interesting? Here's what God says you're going to need. You're going to need some food. You're going to need some knowledge. You're going to need some pleasure. And you're going to need some life. And so he, he gave them something that they could actually go to and get that. Hmm. Hmm. And, and you know what they call that? What, you know what he called that? He called that paradise. <laughs> I don't know what you'd call that. Not a whole lot of stuff to do there. I mean, you didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> I mean, how could you have paradise without a cell phone? I mean, you can't live. Listen, I had a couple of my grandkids come spend the night with me. I got, middle of the night, got worried about it. You know, I got up two or three times just check on them. And there was a light in the room. I looked down. <clears throat> they were sleeping with their cell phone. And I thought, Are they afraid <laughs> to be in Grandpa's house? It's just in case something happens, I'm ready to call 911. So my mind goes nuts now. Or maybe the parents said, keep it on so I can get in touch with you if I need to or if you need me. I'll have mine on. You can call me because Grandpa, you know, he's getting up age and wacky. Or, or did they have it on to listen in case one of their friends needed to talk? So in the morning, I, I didn't do nothing. It's, you know, I just happened to be up at the wrong time. In the morning, I said, I'd like to talk about something about your age for a while. Would you talk with me and talk to Grandpa? They said, well, sure. I said, you know, and so I went through this whole story with him. I said, now, I, I don't know. Why'd you have your phone on during the middle of that? I mean, I shut mine off. I shut the television. I shut the lights. I locked the doors. You know, I go through a routine. I walked him through my routine. I said, I, I locked the doors. Come along with me. I shut off all the stuff. Come with me. Make sure we don't have the stove going or anything. <laughs> Where do we do all that? I shut my phone off when I go to bed. It is, is that normal protocol or is, is it just me? I mean, I hate the phone anyhow, so... Of course, when I had a... a I never unplugged my landline, so I, I guess I had it still on, didn't I? As a pastor, I had to. I don't even leave my cell phone on. If you want me, you're going to have to come and get me. I mean, I turn that baby off because I don't want to be disturbed. I won't be able to sleep through the night. I get up on my own enough. And you know what they told me? They said, well, no, we, we, we feel safe with you, Grandpa. We didn't have it on for 911. It never crossed our mind to do that. I said, did you feel like you needed a nightlight? I, I could have given you a nightlight. No, because, you know, little kids, sometimes sometimes kids want a nightlight. I went, no. They went, no. Oh, God, I didn't need a nightlight. I just, I just, I wanted to be available for my friends if they needed me. And I said, well, give me an example of that. And they gave me an example of it. And I was amazed. I went like, Wow. They gave me an example of why a friend, why they left their phone on in case a friend needed to talk to them. And I went, holy catfish. 
I said, do you have ministry with these kids like that? And they went like, yeah. Yeah, we, we listen to them. We talk to them. We share what we know about it. Isn't that something? So I don't know. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe if you have your kids spend the night with you and you see lights on, maybe, maybe that's going on in their life as well. All right. Let me, let, me, let me close this thing down. In verse 3, in point 3, Adam compiled a dictionary of biblical terms and history during the period of innocence. Listen to me. And they're going to be expelled from the garden, right? But he took his dictionary with him. <laughs> How do I know it? Because these words, that, the, the names and the terms that he used are still in existence today. You go to a zoo? Other than your house, do you, <laughs> you go to a zoo? You see all the animals? Guess who named them all? How do I know it? Because they were in the ark and they got off the ark and they all had names. Adam and Eve. We read about Adam and Eve in the New Testament like they were real people. Oh, they were. Oh, don't mean to think that. See, I say that because I had professors that didn't believe they were real people. They believed that was mythology. And I was paying them to teach me that. Because I wanted a degree. Is that not crazy? When, when he left the garden, he left with a dictionary of biblical terms and history. You can be sure of that. In Genesis 2.19, it says, Whatever the man Adam calls a living creature, that will be its name. And when you study the ark, you will find that to be true. Now, the man Adam called his wife's name. See, when he originally had her, he called her what? Woman. To identify how she came into existence. But as his wife, he called her Eve, the mother of all living. Genesis 3, 20, and we refer to that in the New Testament as fact in 1 Timothy, the third chapter, in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, 13 through 15. We discuss all these spiritual family trees out of Luke 3, 23 through 38. When you study the book of life in the book of Revelation, you discover something else that's magnificent. So, all of this is on your paper. All that's on your paper. So we're going to take a break. Take, we're going to take up the offering, take a break. Then we're going to come back in 15 minutes. Rick's going to give a report on his upcoming trip for prayer. And then we'll look at something else in the scripture. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for the word of God and for the history it brings to us as fact. Not as myth, as fact. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this to our souls that we might see how our, our origin the origin of the human race. Some of the struggles they went through are the very struggles we go through. I pray today, Father, as we give an offering to you, out of, out of the supply of grace that you've given us, we return some of it so that we might reach the most that we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ in Moody, in St. Clair County, in the southern region of America, and throughout the rest of the world. In Jesus' name. Amen. And we're looking at Genesis, uh, the second chapter, verse 7, where we have... Uh, then the Lord God formed man out of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives. That's actually plural in the Hebrew. 
where it says the breath of life is actually the breath of lives. It's nishama ha'im. There's some words in Hebrew that I just love, and that's one of them. Nishama ha'im. It's just easy to... It's the breath of life, lives. You know, dying you will die. This counters that. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. Breathed into his what? Nostrils. The breath of lives, and man became a living being. All right? So I want to take a look at that. I want to show you some things. Uh... That's unique to, uh, to language grammar. Moses is one of those guys that writes Hebrew like Paul writes Greek. And you really have to pay attention to him. Most people, and I was one of those a while back, who didn't pay that much. I was after the gist of what the Hebrew was teaching because I was more interested in what the New Testament teaches. Which I understand, that's, that's where we live. But one of the unique things of Hebrew is conjunctions. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, is because sometimes you can't see them in the English. And let me give you an example of that. See the word then? In second in second Genesis, in Genesis 2 7, see the word then? That's a transliteration of a, a circumstantial wa. Now, let me show you a circumstantial wa. I, I'm not, I don't have it up here. So you draw a line down. Just draw a, draw a little line down. And I'm going to show you a circumstance. You draw a line down in Hebrew, a little line like, like an L, a small L. You draw a line and then put two dots underneath it. When you put two dots underneath that, 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 that line is a wa. And then it, it identifies what kind of a wa. It could, and if there's two dots under, it's a circumstantial wa. And it, it kind of explains it, circumstances. It identifies, it's after some circumstances that are important. It's called a circumstantial, you understand? Circumstance, circumstantial wa. That's the word then. What is interesting is what he did next. So draw another line down, like you did the first line that looks like a, a small L, you know, L. This time, instead of putting two dots down, put a little line underneath it, make sure it's gapped, and then put a little line like that, a parallel, like just a little line underneath it. Make sure it's not attached to the Y, just a line underneath. This is a small line like that. You, are you with me? That's a consecutive wa. A consecutive wa. And there are three of them. So what the circumstantial wa does, he's opening up a subject that he wants you to pay attention to. Because he's been talking about one thing, and now he's switched gears on you. Well, See, he opens up in verse 4. See, remember, verse second chapter, verse 4, opens, opens the second manuscript, right? So he's opened the second manuscript, right? And he's, he's talked about the there's no shrubs and, and yada, yada, and man, you know, there was no man to cultivate. He had a mist. See, there was no man to cultivate the garden. The second manuscript is all about the origin of the human race. Say Isaiah 45, 18, you know. So what he does there, he, 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 he gives you an understanding. See, he said just prior to that, he said, I don't know, I don't, in verse 5, there was no man to cultivate the ground. 
Then he talked about the mist. Then we come back to a circumstantial law of the creation of man. Are you with me? So what he did, he's, he wants to bring this subject into play now. There was no man to cultivate the ground. Then he went on to talk about the mist. Then he came back, and now he wants to interject man into this whole idea of the human race. And now we're picking up this. This thing is really starts here, and we're going to go through the first family. This is the first man of the first family. And then it's going to excel all the way to Jesus Christ. And then Luke, the third chapter, uh, 23 through 38, gives you a good picture of where we're going. From Adam, you know, if you look at 38, you got God, then you got Adam, then you got Seth, and it goes all the way to Jesus Christ. And then the genealogy stops, right? The genealogy stops in verse 23 with Jesus Christ. So that now that everybody's in Christ is in that genealogy. You understand? 2 Corinthians 5, if any man be in Christ, he's part of that genealogy. But this is where it begins. Verse 7. And so he, he introduces this whole idea of, well, where's the man? <laughs> I thought this was about, man. where's the man? There, there's no man to cultivate. Where's, where's the people? Where's the man? And so he comes back and he says, well, well, then. And so he puts a circumstantial law in the front of it when he says, then the Lord God formed man of the dust. Now write this down in your paper, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. You know what that says? It says there's a first Adam and a last Adam. See, that's, that's, that's Luke 3, 23 through 38. There's a first Adam and a last Adam. When you look at Luke, the third chapter, he introduces you to the, to the last Adam in verse 23 and runs you all the way back to the first Adam in verse 38 of Luke, the third chapter. And we're at the stage of the first man of the human race. And so he's introduced this idea. He's introduced it with uh, a circumstantial law and then he, he, he uses it to, to set up three consecutive laws. Three consecutive laws. And that's in the introduction here. Uh, three, three special features of man. A body, a breath, and a being. He used, he used consecutive laws to identify that. Here's how it reads. <clears throat> Here, here's the body. Then Yahweh Elohim, with a circumstantial wa, it's with Yahweh, then Yahweh, with a circumstantial wa, Elohim, formed, that's a cal imperfect, which has, which has a formed, which has a consecutive wa formed a consecutive wa, the man of the dust from the ground. Right? That's the first idea he has. Used a circumstantial, then it went to a consecutive wa. Then he comes to the idea of breath. All of this is in verse 7. Then he comes to the idea of the breath, Nisha Mahayim. He says, and breathed, and breathed, into his nostrils, the, what it says, and breathe, that has, on the front of it in the Hebrew, has a consecutive wa. So you got point A, point B, and point C. He used a consecutive wa with the word body. He used it with the word breath. Cal, a calum perfect with a consecutive wa. And breathe into his nostrils, the Lord God formed the body, and the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives, Nisha Mahayim. Notice Hayim is ends in an I am that makes that plural. I am in Hebrew is plural. 
Then the final statement with a consecutive wa is the word being. See, I broke it down in the way Moses is laying it out. And man, <coughs> see, and man became, that's haya, that's a callum perfect with a consecutive wa on it. See, on these, on these verbs, he put a consecutive wa. All right? He did it with, he did a consecutive wa with the body. He did it with the breath and he did it with the being. Now the word being is not nefesh. See the word nefesh on the word being, a living being, a living being is a soul. The Hebrews, the Hebrews never talked in terms of trichotomy. The Greeks talked in terms of trichotomy. So you don't know man's a trichotomous person like you do under the New Testament. The Greeks identified that man had a body, a soul, and a spirit. In the Hebrew, you just have to study it. When you study it, you get it, right? Because in Hebrew, the word breath and spirit are identical. They are identified together. In the Greeks, they called it pneuma. The breath is pneuma, the spirit is pneuma. The Hebrew is the same idea. When God breathed into their nostrils the breath of lives, you have, you have the spirit of God given. Man has a body. The breath, Nisha Mahaim, brings both physical life and spiritual life. Now, with Adam, this is the way Adam was created. After the fall, the spiritual part is removed, agreed? The spiritual side of man is removed. That's got to come through new birth. Adam's sin took that away. Right? Man's still born physically, but spiritually dead. But in the original form, man was created both physically and spiritually as a whole. Right? <clears throat> see, what, what separates those three ideas, and so you can see trichotomy in it, right? You can see trichotomy. Man, listen, man has a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, you can see it in the Hebrew, but it's done by, cons by the consecutive wa. Here are the circumstances of the creation of man, the word then. And then he lays it out one, two, three with the verbs. They're all calimperfects. We have a body, we have a spirit, and we have a soul. See that? So... And that's the only way you see trichotomy in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul comes right out and says, you have a body, soul, and spirit. You're trichotomous. Well, you're trichotomous in, in Genesis 2.7. Do you understand that? But it's done with a consecutive woe, a wa. I went, went from wa to woe. I don't know how that worked. I'm just showing you something in Hebrew that's really unique. Moses is writing. I mean, he's, he's, he's just writing phenomenal Hebrew. I mean, he's just writing phenomenal Hebrew. And when you study the Hebrew language, you become very conscientious of different uses of a conjunction. And for me, that's exciting. For you, it's, I know, it's a little bit boring. But... This is how you get theology. See, you, you do see a body, soul, and spirit, don't you? See the word breath? That's spirit. You see, you see, you see nephish? See nephish? That's the word soul. See the word N-E-P-H-E-S-H? That's the word soul. And man became a living soul. That's the way the Hebrews think. They think as a unit. They think that everybody, everybody, they think as, as a, a whole unit, a body, soul, and spirit. They think of it, of it, and it is a one unit. 
they all, all these three things have to work together or else you're wacko. When they all work good together, you're in good shape. When you're not, you go to the doctor or the psychiatrist or somebody. All right. Point number one, in Toledoth 1, in Toledoth 1, Moses will use three different Hebrew words to describe the different development of the human body. Now watch this. Yatsar was used in the sculpturing of Adam's male body from the dust of the ground. Now guys, that's really amazing. I, as a farm kid, I picked a lot of dirt up. Even when it was wet, I couldn't do anything but make a ball out of it. And God made a man out of it. Of course, you girls do know that man came from dirt. <laughs> right? It's your job to change him, right? <laughs> Yatsar was used for the sculpturing of, of Adam's male body from the dust of the grounds. You can read about it as well as in our text. You can read about it in Job 33, 6 or Psalms 103 verse 14. Watch this. When it comes to the woman's body, it's bana. Bana. Bana, the Hebrew word, bana was used for the fashioning of Eve's female body from Adam's rib. You can read about that, of course, in Genesis 2, 22 through 23, or 1 Corinthians eleven twelve. 12. Paul says, woman originated from man, and then man came through woman. But all things come from God. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well. And, that and listen, a, a specific, when I get there, we'll talk about it. A specific Hebrew word is used for the creation of Eve's body that was different than the creation of Adam's body. 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 Yada. Yada. Was used for procreation for everybody, everyone's body after the fall of Adam. Genesis 4.1. Adam knew his wife. Yada. Knew. You know who used to say yada a lot? A TV program. Seinfeld. I love Seinfeld. And Cheers. That's the two things I wish they had them back. I, I got a lot of laugh on both those programs. Shows you how warped I am. Uh, for creation, you could look at Job 31, 15, you, you, Ecclesiastes 11, 5, or go to Children's Hospital. <laughs> when you study this, you discover that there are three different categories of body formation. Watch this, but the same breath of lives. We're so screwy today. We're so screwy today. Are we not screwy? I don't mean you and I. We're, we're saying everybody else is insane. You know how many people don't believe that today? That's why you need the Bible, dear hearts. Listen to me. Yatsar, Bana, and Yada. Agreed? But the same Nisha Mahayim. And God, when it came to man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives. When it came to the woman, he breathed into her nostrils the breath of life. When it came into everybody else, he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. And when you were born, he breathed into your nostrils the breath of life. You cried, and we called you by a name. Cry, baby. No, I would. And we named you. This baby can live outside the womb. We name them. All right? Same breath of life, three different forms. 
of the body. Point number two, this means that the breath of life, Nisha Bahaim, came from God, the Lord God, through man's nostril, not from the ground, not from the rib, and not from the genitals. Agreed? Came from, the breath of God came through their nostrils. I would have probably put it in the ear, blow in the ear, but who knows. The doctrinal principle is that the Lord God gives breath to all the people of the earth. That's a common biblical teaching. For example, Isaiah 42, 5. Thus saith the Lord, thus saith God the Lord, that's Yahweh Elohim, who created the heavens and earth and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offsprings, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it or walk in it. This doctrinal principle taught by Moses will be taught again in the flood story of Genesis 6, 17 and the 7th chapter 21 through 22. He's going to talk about the destruction of of all flesh in which had the breath of lives. In verse 22 of the seventh chapter, he's going to say, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. When God when God called, when, when you die, your, the, the spirit in man goes back to God who put it in you. Your body goes to the dust and your soul goes either to heaven or hell. Depending on whether you believe in the gospel of Christ or not. Three. Since the fall of Adam, the human body has been procreated through the woman's womb, Eve, the mother of all living. In Job 31, 15, did not he who made me in the womb make him, and the same one fashioned us in the womb? One of the things that everybody who wrote about this in the ancient world was amazed how God could form a human being in the womb of a woman. Every theologian that ever spoke on it in the Bible was just, it, it was the greatest miracle of any miracles was how God could put together a human body inside of a human womb. That's, you talk about masterful sculpting, that's something. And there was a name for it in the Hebrew, yada. Isn't that interesting? They were all amazed. When you read on that subject matter, they were all amazed at God's amazing grace, how he could do that inside a mother's womb, right? But it was made bana. It was made bana in order to do that. Because of the doctrinal principle of God gives the breath of lives to all people, watch me now, ladies, it is possible for Adam and Sarah who were sexually dead, referred to as barren, for God to open the womb for reproduction. Yeah, that's a miracle, wasn't it? And although that's a pretty big miracle, you know, he was 100 and she was 99. Listen, you think you might have been old when you went to the to these school meetings? You know, in kindergarten, 
Imagine them going to kindergarten meeting. Who are you here for? My child. Oh, 199. I mean, holy macro. I can't even imagine that. How can you? I can't even imagine that. Can't even imagine it. I, I like Romans 4.17's account of that. Talking about Sarah and uh, Abraham. As it is written, a father of many nations I have made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God, which is the idea, yes, God, who gave life to the dead, watch this, and called into being which does not exist. You know what that is? That's a miracle, isn't it? But you know what it's a miracle of? Bara. Only God can create something wonderful out of nothing. <laughs> Listen, it's not truly out of nothing. It's out of his true essence, isn't it? The true essence of God is where miracles come from. Bara, B-A-R-A. Four, the human body of Jesus Christ was uniquely different from all other, of all other bodies of the human race because of Mary's conception by the Holy Spirit. Right? And yet it's got to go through the miracle of formation inside, doesn't it? She's going to give birth to it. Luke 1, 31 through 35, a good read on that. Jesus Christ has to be born outside Adam's sin and the sin nature. That's virgin conception. Mary's conception by the Holy Spirit. By this way, this is how every church age believer is born again by the Spirit of God. Did you know that? Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, so were you. Both, both by conviction and by birth. Regenerated by the Holy Spirit, right? Yes, of course. Of course, dear hearts. John 3, 1 through 8, or Titus 3, 5 through 7. There are three important doctrinal issues related to the body of Jesus Christ, his conception, his life, and his death. Jesus must be born outside of Adam's original sin by conception of the Holy Spirit. Jesus must live without personal sin in order to be offered as the perfect, impeccable sacrifice for sin. Boy, you should read all of these. I laid out some good, heavy verses for you. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Hebrews 4.15, 1 John 3.5, Colossians 1.20-22. These are dynamite passages. Jesus must die as the perfect Lamb of God for the sins of the human race. Again, a lot of passages laid out. I conclude today's session. As a result of personal faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins to receive eternal life, we are urged by Paul. Now, if you have accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, and receive great salvation, here is Paul's encouragement to you and me. Paul urges to present our bodies a living holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, according to his will, which is our spiritual service of worship. You know where that takes place? Everywhere your body is work, school, shopping, I mean, you name it, right? Because your body is the temple of God. It's a mobile unit. It's a mobile church. We are to present our bodies a living holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, that's, that's a 724 ministry, which is our spiritual service of worship. That's true worship. Right? Then well, that's Romans 12.1. Paul gives one big example of that in 1 Corinthians 6, 13 through 7, 2, which is probably the most popular sport in high school. Okay? Well, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Read it and find out. Most popular sport in high school. <laughs> hey. 
Eh, hopefully not everybody plays it, but most of them do. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Rick will take us out of here with a pledge. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way to study with us. We pray for Rick. We lift him before you, Father. Open the doors, clear the path, and push him forward. What a great walk this will be. It won't be without testing and trials. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have it or expect it any other way. But the victory is always in our walk in Christ. It's never the walk in ourself. There's no victory in us apart from Christ. You sent him on a great mission, Father. Africa. Listen, if we have to win them continent by continent, we're, we're open to that. Right now, it looks like that's a, that's a big move of God. I mean, there's just, I've never seen anything like it. We've heard about it and we've read about it where you moved on continents, large masses of people, We've seen that occur in India and China, Europe, America. A great moving of God in Africa. And once again, Father, I pray for that. I pray for you bring all those pastors, clear up their theology, get them passionate, get them to see the glory of God in their lives through the word of God, through the eyes of God, the eyes of the word. Uh, we're so thankful for it. We're so thankful to be a part of it, Father, uh, through Rick's ministry and through his team of guys that are just, they have just bought into it and are doing great, mighty things. We pray for it for our church and for St. Clair County and Alabama and the southern regions to the uttermost parts of the earth. Encourage us, Father. Uh, let us, I'm going to take the advice of my son, Bill. I want, you watch too much news, Dad. You watch too much news. It's depressing. Just get enough information to see how the world is, is and go, go back to your basics of the word of God. I mean, go back to that. What great advice that was for me. Watch too much news. Eh? Watch too much news. Don't pay enough attention to what God is doing. Go back to the word. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.